Well, Nick Bostrom ends his essay uh, with this this sentiment. Again, I'll try to make it readable. The overall risk seems to be minimized by implementing superintelligence with great care as soon as possible. Um, I think that that generally is in the same the same sentiment as a good's first thought in his essay that the survival of man, I mean, put in much more uh, strenuous terms, the, the survival of man depends on the early construction of an ultra intelligent machine. These are optimists view of the singularity. And certainly there is a lot to be optimistic about. If we take goods view again in the 1960s, the concern was no doubt, I think, uh, nuclear war, nuclear holocaust, which is still something that could happen, right? We, we don't think of the world in the same way that we did 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago in terms of the threat of nuclear war, but it's just as real. Uh, and perhaps in a certain sense more real with the nuclear proliferation in, in rogue states like North Korea. And, you know, maybe other rogue states, you know, yeah, I mean, the United States could be considered a rogue state very soon, considering the uh, kind of people who are in control since the uh, election of Donald Trump. To be very frank about it, I mean, I mean I'm mean, i not trying to be partisan about it, but um, I'm, I'm, I think it's just an observation that we have in it. someone who's clearly unstable and incompetent, who's the uh, most powerful person in America. But, you know, I'm... I'm not trying to, if you don't agree with me, that's fine. But uh, I happen to think it's true. But uh, so uh, one may say uh, from Good's point of view that we need the singularity more than ever. And from Bostrom's point of view, it's a risk worth taking. Um, it is, uh, it, the overall risk um, seems to be minimized by implementing super intelligent with, with great care. And he and other thinkers are long on their uh, ideas about what we could do to minimize the potential threats that a superintelligence would bring along with it. But it's, it's, it's difficult not uh, in this context to remember, and I, I mean to remember uh, Jonas's, uh, Jonas's thesis in uh, technology and responsibility and um, one of the things that he you know, ends up with, and I would say maybe his major ethical advice for the supposedly the supposed need for a new ethics and developing a new ethics, which is uh, which is um, a sufficient for our what he thinks is our new situation is the um, ethics of responsible restraint. This idea in the face of the quasi eschatological potentials of our technological processes, ignorance of the ultimate implications becomes itself a reason for responsible restraint as a second best to the possession of wisdom itself. Really wonderfully put there on page 51. Um, the, uh, you know, it goes to the very heart of his thesis and, and what could be more suitable, a more suitable uh, case study for this uh, thesis of responsible restraint than the idea of uh, superintelligence, the singularity in that sense. Um, the quasi eschatological potentials, eschatology really means the end of days, the, the idea of the end of the world. Uh, we have, you know, the singularity amongst other things is the idea of a superintelligence has eschatological potentials. It's a technological process that has such a potential, potential either to wipe out humanity or to so utterly change the conditions of human life that we may ask whether it's worth a life worth living. Um, so I'm, I'm not trying to, I don't think anybody could advise anyone else as to what the ultimate answer is here in terms of whether a, a technological singularity in the form of a superintelligence 
is either something, as Bostrom says, uh, it's either something to be delayed or accelerated. That is, it's either something that we absolutely want to either delay or absolutely prevent or something we want to happen quicker. Um, so um, that is not a, a question that I am going to advise you. I, I just think my job is to try to give you materials that, that lay out both sides and have you decide that for yourself, of course. Of course, decide for yourself. Um, but of course, the again, from Jonas's humanist point of view, it's not just the threat of extinction uh, that uh, is, uh, is in play here, although that's certainly at the top of the list. It's also the threat to the value of human life itself. That is, it may be that we could survive and thrive, as they say, a uh, a super intelligence, a singularity in that in that sense. But it may be that the, the life that is left to us, which will no doubt probably be a post human life, uh, may not be a life that we would exactly want. Um, I think that uh, the most interesting thing. To my mind, that I've come across here in, in doing this reading, preparation for the course, is reading Chalmers' essay, which is, of course, a good essay, but um, in, in its entirety. But I found the most valuable part of it his rather uh, casual uh, notion that there is really only one viable possibility um, for human beings in a post singularity world here, and that is what he calls integration. Uh, that is, he, he, you know, he says that uh, there are different options uh, for, uh, for, you know, how w we might uh, respond to a super intelligence. He says extinction, well, let's just say extinction is bad. Isolation, inferiority, or integration, uh, and extinction, obviously, from our point of view, at least, is not a good option. So let's try to prevent that. Isolation would mean basically uh, somehow isolating ourselves. And uh, I've had some students come up with some very interesting scenarios involving virtual reality, which would allow for human isolation from a super intelligence, but uh, perhaps not uh, one that uh, I think is a good one, although he makes a pretty good case. Maybe I'll upload his essay anonymously so you can take a look at it uh, inferiority where we we cohabitate with the super intelligence but are clearly aren't not in a position to even compete with it or even understand it uh, where we would clearly be the the uh, uh, an inferior species to whatever the super intelligence where it was or what he calls integration which he thinks is the only one uh, the fourth option is the only really acceptable one, integration. But what would that mean? Uh, well, he says on this option, we become super intelligent systems ourselves. And he just very quickly and speculatively uh, goes over the options um, of how we might ourselves keep up with the super intelligence, become ourselves, we human beings who are not super intelligences in a sense. How, how could we become one? Well, in the long, he says, in the long run, if we are to match the speed and capacity of non-biological systems, we'll probably have to dispense with our biological core entirely. <laughs> it's just, you know, kind of like, that's what philosophers do. They say things like that. And you're like, wait a second. Um, yeah, I mean, basically, and then what he goes on to explore in, the, in a large part of the rest of the essay, which I haven't in, included in this excerpt, but you're free to read, uh, is the idea of uh, mind uploading which is a, you know, a thing. I mean, uh, the idea that some, at some point in the future, we'll be able to create a, um, I don't know if I'm mixing my ideas or a software analog to the human brain that will allow us essentially to become immortal because we'll be able to upload our minds, personalities, memories, everything that makes us a person uh, into a digital form which could be uploaded, re-uploaded, and last forever. And the question is whether that's something that we, even if it were possible, whether it's something that we would want.